Welcome back. My next guest this morning has been working on the federal level, Republican Congressman Dan Muser, who represents part of Lebanon County. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be with you. Thanks. Yeah, happy Father's Day. We're going to dive right into this thing. So what I want to ask about is police reform. It is the topic on everyone's mind. What types of things are you doing to assure the folks of Pennsylvania that police reform is something that's being tackled in Washington, D.C.? It's being treated very seriously, I can tell you that. You know, growing up, my father was a, uh, was a police officer. He was a detective. I saw firsthand how he and his friends and his force uh, had to deal with some very, very serious issues. He was uh, homicide, he was narcotics. And so this, um, uh, this situation is, uh, is very serious. Look, what happened to George Floyd was an absolute tragedy. Everyone agrees. Uh, now we need to find people. We all need to be part of the solution. We need to be problem solvers, not problem makers. And for the most part, that's happening. You know, very unfortunately and sadly, we saw, we saw the looting, we, we, we saw the rioting. You know, I had an African-American uh, uh, minister down in Lebanon where there was a relatively peaceful protest say to me that he feels his cause has been hijacked by those that are out with the peaceful protesters, but, but, are, but are, are being violent and, and uh, using, using hateful language. So we, we, we got to all get a grip. We, we, we've got to get on the same page. I just heard what the senator had to say. You know, my goodness, I mean, I, I, what, what can't you agree with, with where, where he's going with this? He wants peacemakers. We need to find solutions. There's a few good pieces of legislation. Tim Scott's Justice Act, um, uh, I reviewed closely. I'm very favorable to. There are aspects of the Democrat proposal that I am uh, favorable to. But look, we need we need community support and we need police support. We got to find that balance. We got to have accountability. Uh, we got to have transparency. We got to have some great communication. And yes, we need more training on the police force. One thing that comes up a lot is a, is a is a database that's needed for police officers so that the municipalities and states know the type of individuals that they're hiring and they can get a better glimpse into their past, maybe their discretions or other issues they may have run into. How do you feel about expanding or creating a database, uh, whether that be with states or federally? Yeah, definitely. Look, when there's a grievance filed or a police brutality uh, 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 accusation, um, first of all, that whole process needs to be transparent, and there certainly needs to be accountability. Yes, but as long as that database is used as the proper tool of what it's designed for, right, to keep bad cops, bad police from moving somewhere else, it can't become a public document uh, that could actually bring some, some danger uh, to a police officer that was involved in a, uh, in, in, in a very difficult um, conflict. Your so father... Properly. Yeah, sorry. I mean, your father was a New York City police officer. What kind of perspective does that give you? I know uh, one thing that you've really um, been critical of is maybe, you know, just eliminating no-knock warrants. Um, can you kind of explain that position and then how your relationship with your father kind of um, challenges you or dictates how you feel or look at these police reform issues? Yeah, actually, my, my father's the one who brought that up to me. He said on these no-knock warrants, he says, look, I get it. But you can't do that all the time. I mean, you might be going to a house where there's a known murderer. You know he's got guns. You know there's bad dudes in there, uh, people. And you, you're not, you, you don't want to, you can't knock, right? You, you could get shot by, by knocking. So, so there could be different degrees of, of no-knock warrants. Yeah, and I think another thing to just kind of go back to is that you do agree with some of the things that are in the House Democrats bill. Uh, and one of those things is banning chokeholds. Can you talk about some of the things that that you are kind of in alignment with and why you think those are important moving forward? Yeah, body cams, things like that. Absolutely no choke, uh, uh, no, no choke policy. Look, the, the, the chiefs throughout my district, throughout Pennsylvania cities, they don't teach choking. I mean, for, as far as they know, it was never taught. Maybe it was 25, 35 years ago, but most many of these chiefs have been on for a long time. So against the no chokes, um, you know, the, the idea of, of, of lynchings being a, a, a hate crime and a federal crime, of course, um, like I said, the body cams, um, you know, a reasonable national registry, uh, a, a, a degree on the no knock, uh, th th these things are good. I think we need more communication. I think the general public and the communities need to know the 
police better. And that, that might sound a little, little mushy, but it needs to be done. A, um, an advisory group on both sides, so they understand the training that they go through. Because most police are there to protect and serve. And when I'm at a, a protest and I hear them saying, you know, blank the police or blue lives murder, and I look in the faces of these young men and women who are out there to serve us, they're, they're distraught, they're despondent, they're sad. That's not what they got on the, on the police force for. So we need, we need to raise the peaceful approach in a holistic way. Let's switch gears a little bit here and talk about COVID-19, the coronavirus, and the effect that that's had not only on Pennsylvania, but on the nation. Uh, as we begin the reopening efforts, we're seeing some states see an uptick in the number of cases. Are you concerned about that? And could you talk a little bit more about the overall response to COVID-19? Yeah, well, look, we had a great economy going into this, of course, one of the best in, in, in 50 years. Uh, we had a deliberate shutdown, not a recession as we know it, a deliberate shutdown, which needed to be a slowdown. That's why we, um, we passed the CARES Act. A lot of good things in there for, for, for people, for families, for employees, for employers, for hospitals, right, for fighting, for finding a vaccine, for fighting the virus. So a lot of good things in there. Uh, moving forward, we, 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 we certainly need to add to that. What I believe is this, we initially the, the, the plan of picking and choosing who could stay open and who, who could stay closed, who should stay closed was, was deeply flawed. What we should have is a certainly initially the, a confinement a shutdown uh, to, uh, to send the message of, of the behavioral changes that need to take place. But absolutely moving forward, we've got to have safe, safe working uh, and school and social environments, uh, safe and healthy. And we need to abide by the CDC guidelines. And we need to all recognize uh, this is going to continue for a while because it's crucial that we keep our economy open and we open our schools. Top priority, we gotta open our schools. I'm for more funding uh, for PPEs, whatever the schools need to open in a safe manner. For those who will go, if they do some remote as well, so be it. We got to get our kids back to school in the fall. You've been pretty verbal about cracking down on scammers during the pandemic and even introduced a bill. Um, can you talk about the need for that and uh, whether or not you're seeing an influx of people trying to take advantage of folks uh, through a scam during the pandemic? Yeah, of course, there are laws on the books now for frauding and, and, and such scams. But what we needed to do and Congressman uh, Tom Swazi from New York joined me and we're gaining many, many sponsors to it. We're, we're first we're sending a strong message directly to scammers during the course of this corona crisis that if you deliberately swindle uh you are going to pay the price uh and the uh the um the uh, penalties will be heightened uh, quite a bit so we're sending that message and we're sending that message to law enforcement as well and to the department of justice uh that we want to find these scammers and stop them and they could particularly prey on, on older Americans and older Pennsylvanians. And that's, um, that's, 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 that's not good. While we're on the topic of uh, legislation that you are invested in, I did want to bring up the infrastructure bill that, uh, that you wanted to talk about, um, you know, specifically with investors trying to get in, whether there'd be private companies in some of these projects. Can you just talk about that and, and what that would mean for Pennsylvania? Yeah, absolutely. We, we were in dire need even before this crisis for a transportation infrastructure bill on a federal level. Uh, now, more than ever, we, we need an infrastructure uh, bill. Uh, our roads need to be modernized. We certainly need to keep them up kept, but we can't put it all on the taxpayers. Uh, it simply doesn't work out. The level of gasoline taxes would, would go far too high uh, for the average family and, and, and in general. So what we've developed is something called the Infrastructure Bank of America. It would use private capital, private investment. Uh, it would be privately owned, privately managed, uh, regulated by the Fed. It would be a government uh, uh, enterprise, so it, it will uh, be uh, regulated appropriately, uh, but it will, again, be all privately funded, and it could raise as much as 400 to $500 billion on an annual basis uh, that would be dedicated towards uh, usually revenue-generating projects, but it can be used for anything. And something that's, that's of particular interest and should be is that China has such infrastructure banks and we have almost a trillion dollars a year from U.S. investment firms that go to such 
China uh, and, and other international infrastructure banks, we got to keep our investment dollars here and build our infrastructure, not, not the Belt and Road system. Congressman Muser, thank you very much. We appreciate you being on. Happy Father's Day, as I mentioned. Hey, thanks. Happy Father's Day. Thanks a lot. Take care. Next, I'm joined by the CBS.